Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Thanks for dropping by my weekly workshop, coming to you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. For those new arrivals to our community, the weekly workshop features a compilation of my content from the last seven days, including, but not limited to, inspiration for would-be side hustlers and full-time giggers, tool and gear reviews, and finding financial and lifestyle freedom through entrepreneurship. And also, if you prefer your content of the video variety, you can find it all at toolmantim.co. Thanks for taking the time to have a listen, and with that, let's dive into this week's edition of the Weekly Workshop. Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we build business, create community, find freedom, and share success. It's Monday morning, which means it's time for another Money Making Minute. And this week I got a really cool one. This week is a community sourced video that was inspired by a couple of you guys, specifically Ken Cornelius, you know who you are out there, who started sharing with me some tips on my favorite cleaner, residue remover, whatever you want to call it. So this week we've got a community sourced video of my top four uses for goof off. All right, guys, real quick before we dive into the review, if you're new here and you don't know who I am and want to check out more about me, go to toolmantim.co. That's toolmantim.co. You'll find everything you need there, including the shop where I have a whole bunch, over a hundred recommended products that I have used. Amazon links there so you can check them out. If you pick any of them up, they'll help support the channel. And if you want to become part of our monthly mailing list, at the same website, the link at the bottom, sign up for our monthly workshop once a month email to find out everything that there is to know that's going on in the workshop. All right, guys, so you guys know that I love goof off. I love to goof off. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so this has been my go to. Well, anyway, let's get into it, but it's been my go to remover, my go to cleaner for industrial accidents for the last three years. Ever since I started using it, I realized, man, this stuff is good. And keep in mind, this is just the residential grade biodegradable stuff. There is a professional grade, which <laughs> I've been reminded on multiple occasions, make sure you wear breathe, or like a mask or gloves. Don't want to get that on your skin. This stuff probably still isn't recommended, but on the bottle, it says it's totally safe to use. Uh, this one I tend to use without gloves, doesn't matter. Anyway, so Let's get in to our top four uses of Goof Off. And number one, as you guys have always heard my famous tagline, if you're looking for a product that will remove paint off vinyl siding, well, this is it. Let me tell you, back when I was just learning how to start, or how to do big paint jobs, I, was, I did the best I could, right? And we had to paint this garage, and it had 12-foot ceilings with stucco. And I was still really learning. It was a lot of loose stucco. I should have cleaned it better. But what ended up happening was as I would roll, I'd get a ton of splatter. And I thought, you know, before we started, we did our due diligence and we put down rags and uh, drop cloths in the whole works. And it worked pretty good. But you know what? I ended up having a lot of over splatter that I was not happy with. It was just it was all over the cement floor. And I panicked because I was new at this. I didn't know what to do. Did a half-ass job. I should have done better anyway. So... I went into my local home hardware, love those guys there, they're awesome, and of course, once again, I said, help, I've got paint on the floor and I need to remove it. They said, try this, it'll work. And I'd use Goo Gone, but it was really oily and stuff before, never used it for paint, it was okay. This stuff is literally the cat's ass. It worked, my God, did it work. Spray it on, brush it off. Spray it on, let it soak for 30 seconds, brush it off and it worked great and then you know to the point where my daughter decided to paint her steps this year and she wasn't as careful as she should have been like father like daughter right ended up getting a bunch of paint and stain on the vinyl siding she come over and of course didn't want to buy her own dad can i borrow your goof off she took it and it worked so number one man this is the best paint over spray remover that i have found number two and this one comes from ken our buddy ken cornelius or more specifically his wife now the biggest problem was i couldn't find a volunteer to test this one out so i'd love to hear from you guys but i love this community centered mindset i love getting all this interaction from you guys but this one was removing gum from hair now <laughs> I suppose I could have probably got a doll or whatever, but I asked my twins and neither of them wanted to let me slather their hair with gum and then use goof off to get it out. But <laughs> I digress. But they, they said basically 
spray it in, let it sit, and then comb it out, and it comes out really well. And you know what? I did a bunch of reading on the internet, and it turns out it really does work. Again, make sure you use the biodegradable stuff because you do not want to be using the industrial strength stuff in somebody's hair. But you know, it's been a few years since any of my kids, well, my adult kids are moved out, but any of my other kids have gone to bed with gum in their mouth. Charlotte, I'm looking at you. I love you. She's not actually here, but she'll hear this in the video. Fallen asleep and then woken up with gum crusted in their hair. It happens. And you know what we normally do is just cut it out. But then they have that funny patch in their hair and they're embarrassed. So the next time, hopefully it never happens again because they are 11 now, but I am going to test this out. And if I get gum on carpet, upholstery, that sort of thing, this is supposed to work that way as well. So thanks for the tip, Ken. Thank your wife for it too. I always appreciate that. Number three, and that is removing Sharpie. This stuff will work, but the professional industrial grade is better. This was recommended to me by a user over on Float. So if you guys don't follow me over on Float, or if you're not over on Float, go by and check it out. I love the platform. I've got just about 800 followers over there. It's F-L-O-T-E dot A-P-P. And I went back through to find it. I'd written the, the tip down. So if you were the one who shared that tip with me about getting Sharpie off the walls, please contact me and I'll, I'll put your uh, contact info in the description below because I hate it when I can't remember somebody's name. But basically they said they had a bunch of rental properties and whenever they'd go in, of course, there'd always be Sharpie on the walls. I don't understand it. I don't know why, but they use the industrial strength goof off to get in there, spray it and remove it. Now I got to say, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I used to use Ma uh, Mr. Clean Magic Erasers and I like them, but I don't know if anybody's noticed they seem to disintegrate faster, almost Maybe I'm just, you know, up in the clouds or maybe I'm looking for a conspiracy theory where it isn't. But I think when they first put those damn things out, they realized they were too durable. So they started cutting the quality back so you'd have to get more. But I just can't seem to get them to work as well. They will if you scrub them, you know, a uh, magic eraser or, again, my favorite uh, smoke and Sharpie cover up. But bin sealer paint, that works really well as well. But industrial strength, goof off, will actually remove it. And tip number four, this one come from our buddy Ken Cornelius again. And this is the one that inspired me to start collecting up these tips. This tip was so good. I don't want to spoil it, but it literally is. Anyway, it was, so, I loved it because I ended up having a product that I used for one thing, removing paint off of stuff. And it never bothered. I never bothered to try it in any other way. And Ken said, you need to try this stuff on getting bugs off the front of your windscreen, your windshield, and the, uh, the front grill of your truck. Now, I got to say, if you guys have ever been to Alberta, I'm sure it's the same in other places. But the bugs out here, as soon as they squash, they turn to like this hard resin glue on the front of your truck. Pressure washing alone is a pain in the ass to get it off. You have to pressure wash and wash and wash, and it still doesn't want to come off. I used to use... Spray 9. If you guys have used Spray 9, it works okay. I've had a couple community members recommend it, but it does not work as good as Goof Off. See, I just spoiled it, but I had to talk about it. <laughs> so Spray 9 and pressure washing together usually worked pretty good, I have to say. And Josh over at Gander Flight, he recommended using a damp dryer sheet. I haven't tried that one out yet, but I'm going to do maybe a side-by-side -by, -side by side test of a few different ways to remove bugs off the front of a, a vehicle. But you guys, I want to cut to some footage here and show you this one. This tip was so good, it blew my mind. So hang in, I'll be right back. So we're going to just spray it with goof off. I'm going to let it sit for 60 seconds because it's really hot. We're going to use some of our famous grab rags and see how easy it comes off. Then we're also going to test out a new scraper I picked up, up on the windshield with the goof off as well. So hang in there. We will give this 60 seconds and we'll see how it works. We're just going to do a little patch here. All right, that should be good. Okay, so I have not tested this whatsoever, never tried it before. So you will get to see what my reaction is going to be. But all I can say is even a pressure washer doesn't do well on these bugs. So if it even softens them up half and then I'm able to wash them off with a hose or a pressure washer from here, I will be impressed. But here goes. Well, I got to say that is a hell of a lot better, Ken, than I even expected. Look at that. That was one minute with goof off. Wow, that is disgustingly cool. I've never had something that wiped off bugs quite as easy as that. 
gonna need a second coat to get it going real good, but that is as thick and nasty as you are gonna find for bugs on the prairies. I gotta say, that is an A1 tip. Thanks, Ken Cornelius, <laughs> love the last name, and so what that tip to me was worth the price of admission alone and that's what inspired me to do this video was showing you guys sometimes there's outside the box ideas or concepts that we can use products for that we never think of and goof off was easy to recommend to begin with but with this new tip from ken for removing the bugs off the front of the truck and combined with uh, the stanley scraper that you saw for taking it off the windshield top notch number one so i hope you guys like this i'd love to do more community sourced videos you, you just I love getting your guys' knowledge because this old brain can only hold so much and there's tons of things I've never thought of and I'd love to be able to share with everyone else. So if you got some tips for any one of the today's tool products, anything I recommend or anything just out of the ordinary outside the box, share it with me. Put it in the description below or in the uh, comments below guys. And hey, if you're new here and you want to become part of the community and hang around, hit the subscribe button. Stick around. We love sharing our knowledge with one another and I love talking about tools. All right, guys, that's it for me this week. Thanks for dropping by. I always love it when you spend time with me in the shop. And as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. Hey, guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we build business, create community, find freedom, and share success. It's Tuesday, which means it's time for another edition of Toolbox Tuesday. And this week, I've got a really cool product for you. So let me tell you a little story. You guys know that I keep an above ground pool in the backyard for me to cool off in, but more importantly for my kids. And every morning for about two weeks, I'd wake up in the morning and I would see that pool was down about an inch. And I knew I wasn't losing it through evaporation and I could see the ground was damp around the outside. So I walked around, walked around, couldn't find a hole anywhere, which means the holes in the floor underneath of 42 inches of water or whatever. And I did not want to drain the pool to have to find it. So I decided to go on a search to find a product that supposedly would seal that up underwater. And what I ended up with was Gorilla Patch and Seal Tape. All right, guys, real quick before we dive into this week's review, if you want to know more about who I am, check out toolmantim.co. That's toolmantim.co. You'll find all my social media links there, a link to the monthly, once a month newsletter that I send out. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's toolman underscore underscore Tim. The link's in the description below. You'll get uh, kind of preview access to a lot of the new tools I got coming in. Some really cool stuff. Some projects I'm working on in my handyman business and around my home. And just, you know, day-to-day -day stuff that I'm up to. So give me a follow over there. Check it out and let me know when you do. I love Gorilla products. I've had really good luck with a lot of them. I've watched some reviews on some of the wonky ones out there, and some people just don't like them. But everything I've used so far from the Gorilla brand has worked. And when I discovered that I had a hole, which ended up being two holes in my pool floor, I knew I had to come up with something. So I started watching videos, and sure enough, I found this guy right here. The uh, Gorilla Patch and Seal Tape. And... After I applied it to my pool, I discovered they also had a white version, even though I could only find the black in the stores. White would have been a lot better for the pool, but you know what? So I'm okay with the fact that it shows up like a sore thumb in there. No big deal at all. So how does this stuff work? Well, first off, I'm going to cut here and show you guys a little bit of footage, and then I'm going to come back to tell you a little more about it. Today, I have my two beautiful assistants, one who is the camera lady Oops, helping me out, and we are out here trying to track down a hole in our pool. Uh, you can't see it, but uh, I got some other footage over there on the back. There's a little bit of water coming out behind the pool. And everybody might say, well, Tim, it must be coming out of the pump. It's not coming out of the pump. We've checked. So we have picked up a new product called Gorilla Waterproof Patch and Seal Tape. We're going to run it through the ringer. We're going to see how it turns out, whether it lives up to the hype. It's highly recommended from a lot of community users. So we're going to give it a shot. Let's see what we got on here. It says it'll patch roofing, gutters, pool liner. Uh, it says great for plastic, metal, aluminum, rubber, wood, vinyl, glass, steel, acrylic, made in the USA, which for us Canadians is about as close to home as we can get. And it is a top-notch product. I have not been let down with anything of the Grella brand. So let's open her up here while I get you, and we'll see what it looks like. Feels like a roll of hockey tape or hockey pucks. So there it is. Looks pretty thick pretty sticky almost like a membrane and see how this comes off here 
So, oh yeah, that is what we end up having. So we'll use our uh, Fastback Milwaukee knife to cut off a piece afterwards. But first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get in the pool because it is damn hot today. And we are going to explore and try to find a spongy spot in the floor of the pool to see if we can find where the hole is. Okay, so I hope that kind of shows you a little bit about it. I had some frustration at first for sure. Uh, the first piece we put underwater, okay, so a few things to tell you about this product is, number one, uh, the black side's where it's gonna show up. The gray side is the adhesive, but there is a plastic coating on there. Uh, when I first started, I thought maybe there was a plastic coating on both sides. There is not. So I spent a lot of time trying to peel a non-existing, uh, you know, protector coating on the outside. It didn't come off, but you pull the inside off. Now, if it's in the sun, in the air, in the heat, do not touch the stuff. It is sticky as all get out. And if you t let it touch itself, that piece is wrecked. It literally fuses itself within a second and it you can't even tell where one side starts and one side ends at that point. So it's that sticky. Now, I will say, and they do show it, you know, applying it underwater and it does work, but it's not as sticky as you think it should be underwater. So we cleaned around, you know, there's a little bit of sand around the hole and we went down under, we put the first one down and it just didn't stick. I don't know if it was because it was an old roll or, or that part had been exposed to the air. I don't know what caused it, but that first piece didn't stick as well as I wanted. So we took a second piece about, you know, four by four uh, inch square. And what I did this time was I took a flooring roller, one of them small little short flooring rollers. And I had my daughter sit on my shoulder so I'd keep me underwater. And I rolled it, I kind of knitted it in place back and forth a bunch of times. And that held, it held really well. And then I got up the next morning and you know what? I still had water all over the ground. I thought, my God, what in the world? This is a piece of crap. Well, hang on because, so a few days later, every day we're still losing a little bit of water, but you know, I left that patch. I got in the pool a few days later and I tried to pull it up and it was stuck good enough that I could not remove it. So it was doing the trick. It was working. It's just, I had a yet undiscovered bigger hole in the floor of my pool. A few days later, my daughter's in there. She's like, guess what, dad? Guess what? I found the hole. I'm like, Yes, Charlotte. All right. So in she goes with another piece and she gets halfway underwater and accidentally stuck it to itself and that one was ruined. So we cut it off, threw it out and got a new piece. She went down, stuck that down, used the roller a few times and the hole was sealed. So if you are looking for something that will seal a hole underwater, this stuff is the cat's ass. Now I figured, hey, what the hell? Let's try it out. So if you watch my Shuvu review, you'll know that I tried to use some of that to patch an air hole leak in my inflatable hot tub. It worked pretty good. If I'd have let it sit maybe an extra few more hours, I probably would have had a perfect patch. So anyway, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try this. So I took two four by four pieces, overlapped them over it, and I have not had a bit of air leakage in the hot tub. So if you're looking for something to patch an air hole, this, I mean, this thing, it's 20 bucks in Canada for 10 feet, so two bucks a foot, but it's worth it. I mean, it's already paid for itself in saving me frustration and anger <laughs> just with the two holes in the pool. And the, uh, the, the gravy was the hole in the inflatable hot tub. So this stuff is thick. It's like an actual membrane. It's about an eighth of an inch thick and it's really rubbery. It's hard to cut unless you have a really sharp knife or a pair of scissors. And if you cut through it with scissors, it's going to stick a little bit. It's good from, let me see, minus 70 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So this shit will work in the coldest of cold and the hottest of hot. And I'm going to try it this winter just to see. It's going to get to minus 40, I'm sure. And we'll stick it to something to see if we can make it stick like a tongue to a frozen flagpole. Um, one other thing you should know is that the top and bottom is sticky. So if you're going to set it on something, it's going to pick up some dirt. And if it gets real hot where it's sitting, it could leave some residue or just, you know, stick the hell of itself down to it. So just be careful. Maybe put down a piece of wax paper, parchment paper or something before you do. But it doesn't ruin the tape at all. Uh, like I said, 10 feet, 2 bucks a foot. Uh, a 10 foot roll is just about a pound. So it's heavy stuff. And it's made to hold up. It just works. It does what it's supposed to do. I got to say, the first day I used it, if you'd asked me, I told you it was a total piece of roll of toilet paper is all it was. Although you wouldn't want to use that to wipe your nether regions. But anyway, but honestly, once I let it set up in the pool, this stuff has worked perfectly. So it's definitely made the Toolman Tim seal of approval. It's going to go in the shop as a recommended product because it works. It's great. And for the cost of it, it's absolutely worth it. So I hope that helps, guys. If you're looking for a recommendation to seal a hole underwater or just in an area even where water's going to be or air or anything like that, this Gorilla Patch and Seal Tape really, really works. So 
Thanks for hanging out with me in the shop, guys. If you're new here and you want to know more about who I am and join the community, hit that subscribe button. Keep coming back five videos a week, including Sunday night live stream talking tools, where a lot of times I share my thoughts on a tool one year later. And honestly, we sit around, shoot the shit and get to know each other. And that is more fun than anything else. So thanks for hanging out with me in the garage, guys. You know, I always appreciate it. And as always, stay happy, stay healthy and have a great week. Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we build business, create community, find freedom, and share success. It's a wonderful Wednesday morning, which means it's time for another tool time gear review. And as always, I've got something good for you. You guys might have seen uh, about a month ago now that Diablo was nice enough. They saw my Diablo video and decided to reach out and send me a care package, which I really do like some of their products, but I told them the only way I would take them is if I could give honest reviews on a few of the products. And this week, I want to talk to you about the one that caught my eye the most, the 12 inch Diablo pruning blade. Guys, real quick before we dive in, if you want to know more about me, you know the routine, toolmantim.co, or if you're new here, run by and say, see toolmantim.co. You'll find everything there is to know about me, my social media links, sign up for the monthly newsletter, check out the weekly audio podcast, and check out the shop where I have over 100 products listed that have solved problems for me in my handyman business and in my real world life. So check that out, guys. Okay, so this week... You know, like I said, I have always enjoyed my Diablo circular saw blades, but most of their products, to be absolutely honest, are a little on the expensive side. Now, they're, they do claim that they're made to last a lot longer, and that is great. I do like that about them. But most times when you go to the shop or go to Home Depot or Home Hardware, one of those places, and you look and you're like, ah, I don't know, I need a reciprocating saw blade. Do I want to spend all that extra money or am I okay with the generic or lesser priced ones that I've used for a long time. And to be honest, most times I just go with those. And I may not have bought these products for a long time simply because I didn't want to spend the extra money on these pruning blades. And again, I have a perfectly good chainsaw that I love to use, but I thought it would be kind of cool to give these guys a test. And of course, soon after I picked up these blades, we had a great big plow wind come in. Might even have had a little rotation to it, who knows. But it was big enough to pick a whole bunch of stuff up and knock some tree limbs down that were even six inches in diameter. So if you guys want to check out this thing in action, let's cut to some footage. These guys got 4.8 stars out of 5 on Amazon with over 500 reviews. They're carbide teeth, which isn't as common on reset blades as you might think. Three teeth to per inch, so there's a big gap there which is supposed to work really well for... Uh, uh, chip removal and material removal and help it keep it uh, calm or uh, not not from getting so hot which is kind of nice the blade coating on there helps it cut back and forth really smooth I've done quite a bit of cutting and you only just start to see the paint wearing off a little bit for comparison there's a brand new blade right there this is the package they come in a 10 pack right now there's a three pack for just over 30 bucks American on Amazon so they're about 10 bucks a piece now, Diablo claims that they'll last 50 times as long as a normal reset blade. I have no doubt. I mean, it seems like it's going to hold up, but I'm, to be honest, I'm never going to use, I, I may never even wear one of these blades. I'll use them, and I'll use them a lot. Do they work well? Absolutely. Are they as fast as a chainsaw? No. Are they supposed to be? No. Do they give a really nice, really smooth cut to the, the limb that's coming off? Yes. So what did I learn using these? At first, I really didn't like them. And that's simply because I was holding them back and I wasn't getting them right in against that shoe right there. So it was really, really vibrating. And mine has a little bit of an oscillating to it too. So that may be a bit of an issue. But what I did find is there's a sweet spot. And it's like that with uh, a pole saw too. You gotta, you gotta get used to where to set the blade when you're cutting. But it seems to be somewhere in around here you put the branch. And then you kind of got to go to about a 45. And when you hit that, that goes through it like a hot knife through butter. Now, am I going to switch over from all my landscaping gear to using a reciprocating saw with a 12-inch blade for cutting this kind of stuff? No. But if you read online, what a lot of guys have used these for is actually cutting out 
uh, roots down into the ground. And I can tell you one thing, I damn well know that I'm not going to be taking my DeWalt 60 volt chainsaw and digging it down into the ground and doing that. And a cheaper reciprocating saw blade is going to end up bending, warping, getting wonky. But a lot of the reviews I read, people were very happy with poking these down in the ground. And this nice blade here is really good at hooking in and getting started. But it's really good for that. So, you know, you could call it the demolition blade of uh, pruning saws. But, you know, if I happen to be out doing some work for a customer, obviously don't have my chainsaw, but I have my reciprocating saw and I have a couple of these blades in my toolbox, absolutely I'm going to use these. They give you a nice, smooth, fast cut, a little bit slower than a chainsaw, but nobody said they're a chainsaw blade either. So there's another tip online from an Amazon user. He said he uses spray silicone, uh, just applies it a little bit to the blade after every three or four cuts, and it helps it go through like a hot knife through butter. So will this ever, will these Diablo pruning blades ever replace my chainsaw? Absolutely not not in a hundred years. But who is this for? Okay, number one, if you don't already have a battery powered chainsaw and you have very little use for a battery powered chainsaw, but you're worried about being able to clean up, say after a windstorm, or you just have, you know, say a few branches every year that hang down in a country driveway or something like that, and you want a cordless way to do it that won't kill you, won't break the bank. Well, a two or three, two or three of these guys is a lot cheaper than buying a new cordless chainsaw. Now, hey, who doesn't like buying a new toy? I get it. But for me, for the person who, who these are designed for, I mean, you know, a landscaper may keep some of these for certain uses. They need to reach in certain spots or tight little things. One thing I like about this is you can kind of insert it in and you don't have to, you can be a little more dainty with it. Maybe that's the right word. So like with a chainsaw, you know, you've got that big wide blade that's going to be spinning and cutting when you get it in there. But with this guy, you've only got uh, about an inch, inch and a half. You just stick it in, get it in there and you can cut just the limbs off you want. I like that too. But honestly, the way I see these is for homeowners, you know, or people that live in storm areas that have some cleaning up to do that don't want to keep a chainsaw around, don't want to have to deal with chain oil. These are absolutely perfect for that. And they are durable too. I for the use I use them, I like them. I will run them through some more tests. I probably won't do another follow-up video unless you guys really want one, but I'll post some of the footage on social media just to let you know what I think of it. But you know what? This Diablo brand, great. Uh, you know, I probably, I really appreciate them sending me these because I probably wouldn't have spent the money on them to get started with. But now that I have them, I'm going to put them through their paces. I'm going to test them and I'm going to report back to you guys and let you know what my future thoughts are on them. But yeah, for anybody who's just a backyard hobbyist or just has a few branches they need to clean up every, once or twice a year from a storm, these will work perfect for that. And they'll last forever. One blade will probably do you for a few seasons. So I hope you guys liked that look at these uh, Diablo blades, uh, put them to the test, showed you a little bit of footage of how they actually worked. And yeah, I hope that did it for you guys. I appreciate it. I love you guys dropping by, hanging out in the shop with me. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Interact in the comments below. Let me know other videos you'd like me to do, maybe head-to-head -head comparisons of different things. Whatever. I, I'm game for almost anything. If you guys like talking about tools or listening to me talk about tools, keep dropping by. I always appreciate it. So that's it for me this week, guys. As always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. Good morning guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we build business, create community, find freedom, and share success. It's Saturday morning, which means it's time for the weekend workshop. And as always, I've got a really good topic for you this week. There's been a lot of discussion in the comments on my generator videos on the TriFuel generator. And the big thing is around its bigness. The whole idea of the generator being maybe too big to be practical. And there's been a lot of talk about sometimes a smaller generator might be better for you. So I thought I'd put together a list this week of the five reasons a smaller generator might just be for you. All right, guys, real quick before we dive in, you know who I am, but if you're new here and you want to know a little more about who I am, run by toolmantim.co, that's toolmantim.co, 
and you can find all my social links there and check out the shop. You can find it at toolmantim.shop and that's where I have over a hundred links to Amazon products that I've recommended, stuff I've used in my business that's made me money or saved me money. Bunch of different categories over there. We've got painting supplies, hand tools, cordless tools, prepping supplies, and household items, whole bunch of different stuff that I've used. So if you want to find that out, run by, check that out and see some of the stuff that's worked for me. All right, so guys, this week, like I said, there's been a big discussion in the comments on my Furman tri-fuel generator review videos and some of the follow-up stuff. And I've had a lot of people say, well, you know, it's a really good generator, Tim, but it's just not practical. It's too big. It's too heavy. It's too noisy. It's too powerful. That being said, absolutely. If you're looking for a whole home generator that is portable with quotation marks around it, the Furman Tri-Fuel was an, is an awesome choice. It's an awesome choice for me, and it might be an awesome choice for a lot of you guys. But in a lot of cases, smaller can be better. Don't say a joke there, Tim. So I wanted to share with you guys my five top reasons you might consider a smaller generator over something a little bit larger. So number one, and this is what a lot of these decisions come down to, a smaller generator, all things being equal, is going to be cheaper. So if money's a consideration, I mean the Furman, I, I talk about the Furman because that's the one that I have, but you know, any generator up in that 9,000 peak watt range is going to be expensive. And the bigger you go, the more parts that are into it, the more expensive it is. So if cost is a consideration, you might think about going smaller. A small generator is better than no generator whatsoever. And if you're in the process of saving up to buy a big generator and all of a sudden a big hurricane comes and you don't have your generator, well, spending a little bit of money to get the smaller one might have been all you really needed to get started. Another aspect of the cheaper end of things is simply, you guys have heard me say two is one, one is none, three is a guarantee. Well, you know, I'm not going to go out and buy two tri-fuel whole house generators. Just not going to do it. But if you had, if, if you're looking at spending less money on a smaller generator, save up by the first one, you might be able to have enough to save up and buy the second one, or you might have enough to buy two small ones up front. So then you've got one that can stay brand new in the box, one that you can run all the time, and if you happen to have a breakdown during the big power outage, big snowstorm, whatever it happens to be, you can say, oh, Tim was right, two is one, one is none, three is a guarantee. Well, you've got two of them, one's dead. If I'm on my Furman generator right now, I'm all of a sudden thinking, how am I going to run my house on my little suitcase generator? But if you've got yourself two little 3,000 watt generators, the first one dies, you just pull that one out and you keep going. And in some instances, you can get two small ones for the same price or even less than one of the big ones. So, you know, when money's a consideration, a smaller generator, all things being equal, equal is definitely going to be a little bit cheaper for you. So that might be something to think about. Where's your budget? How much do you have to spend? How much can you justify right now? Not how much would you like to spend? Because that's a big part of it too. When you're looking at your budget, you can think, oh, I'd really love to go get that top of the line, inverter, natural gas, propane, gasoline, diesel, wood-fired generator. It's only $12,000. I've only got 800 bucks in the account, but I can take out a loan to do it. No, you know what? Work within your budget. If, you can, if all you can afford is a smaller generator, it might just work for you. So a smaller generator sometimes, depending on your budget, could be the one you need. Number two, and this is a big one. This is one of the ones that everybody is, I don't want to say complaining, but everybody's talking about in the comments, and it's less fuel. Less fuel to buy, less fuel to store, less fuel to rotate, less of a chance of an accident. So with a big generator like I have, you know, you're going to go through two five-gallon jugs a day. That's a lot of gasoline, and the bigger the generator, the more fuel it's going to use, even on idle. So you're just going to be pumping through all that fuel. I've got mine set up to hook up into natural gas, which is a huge help. But again, if we're just talking about a gasoline generator, the bigger the generator, the more fuel you have to have. And if size is a consideration, space is a consideration, that takes up a lot of storage space. 12 five-gallon jugs of gas, which is a pretty common fuel storage system you guys have heard about plenty of times, takes up a lot of space, costs a fair bit of money, at least up front to get it started, and it's it's a lot of gas to have stored. Some people aren't comfortable having that much gas on hand in a garage or in a storage shed or that sort of thing. So if you have a smaller, you know, if, if you cut your generator in half, and I'm not, this is just rudimentary back of the napkin math, but of course, if you cut your generator in half, in theory, you should be able to store half the amount of gasoline. Or, 
The inversion of that is, if you still store your 60 gallons, 12 5 gallon jugs of gasoline, then that smaller generator should be able to run twice as long. And then of course if you get into intermittent turning it on, turning it off, running it only as you need it, running it only during the day, whatever it happens to be, you can spread that out a lot. But again, the bigger the generator, the more gas it uses. Hence, the smaller the generator, the less gas it uses. So if you've got one stockpile of gas, my big Furman's going to sip through that or guzzle through that a lot quicker than your smaller one's going to sip through it. Number three, much easier to move. Now, I will say I'm a big, lumbering, strapping young man. Not young anymore, Tim. Don't say that. <laughs> you know, the generator itself is heavy. My, my big Furman, it's about close to 200 pounds. So to lift it onto a truck, it honestly takes my wife and I and it's not easy. Even just to lumber it around the backyard, it has a great uh, lift handle, a great wheel kit on it, and I love it. But when there's snow and sleet and, or wet mud or whatever it happens to be, it is, I, in my garage, it's not too bad on level ground, but try to take it into the backyard when I'm ready to hook it up in an emergency. It can be, it, it can be rather awkward, dangerous, difficult, insert your adjective there, but it's true. It, it's just, it's heavy. The damn thing is like a ton of bricks and to move it around can be an issue. Now, if you're not as big as me, if you're not as mobile as me, if you're not as strong as I am, uh, you know, if you're not as uh, young and limber as I am, or somebody half my age that is, then you may really want to consider having a smaller generator. You know, some of those suitcase size generators are really nice. They're still heavy to pick up, but they're small enough that you could throw it on, say, a dolly cart and wheel it around. Or you could, um, well, even just the small little, say, 3,000 watt ones with the wheel kits on them are so much easier, even for somebody half my size to wheel around. And make sure, when you look at them, take a look at the wheel kits that they come with. Look for the big, knobby tires, sometimes the the non, the ones that, the, the ever, the, the never flat, that's the word I'm looking for. Look for the ones with the big knobby tires, the never flat ones that run over just about anything. Those are really good. They're a lot easier to pull through, say, snow or grass than them tiny little, the old style dolly wheel carts that are about an inch and a half thick. That Those those wheels are horrible. They're, they're great on cement, but anything off-roading, not that you want off-road much with your generator, but yeah, just look for something that you can move around because, again, if you've got a 9,000 watt generator and you're at work and your wife has to turn the generator on and she can't handle moving that around, that could be an issue. So you might consider going with something smaller simply because it's more mobile, easier to move, easier to lift. Say you're going camping. Say you want to buy a generator because, again, any of these big purchases, I always say, is really nice to have that you're going to use for, mul have multiple use cases for it. So, yes, I love my generator. And it's great to be able to use it for a power outage. But I kind of broke my own rule with this one because it's too big to haul around with my damn camper. It's not practical to even throw on the back of the truck and take it with me. So I have my small suitcase generator that'll run the air conditioner and that sort of thing. But I broke my rule. So if you're thinking about, hey, I'd like something that'll run almost everything in my house or a lot of the stuff in my house, but I also want it to be small enough that I can throw it on the trailer hitch or the little basket on the back of my camper and take it with me for the weekend, well then you don't want a whole house 200 pound generator because what are you gonna do with it? I mean, you know nobody's gonna steal it. Well, I say that, but it's not practical. It's like, you know, for my American friends, if you wanna conceal carry, you need to have something that you're actually going to carry. Something that That's the reason I got my neck knife, because I hate things in my pockets. So I want to have something that's small enough and comfortable enough, but powerful enough to do what I need to do. And that's the same thing with a generator. So if you've got a generator that's too heavy, it's no good for you. You're only going to literally use it for the power outage. And maybe that's the only reason you want it. But it sure is a lot better to have a generator that you can also take with you, say camping, or say you got to bug out. Say you got to, I don't know, go live in a Walmart parking lot with your camper for a while. You want to be able to bring your generator. Or say you've got a cabin you go to and you'd like to take it with you. Well, you're not putting that on the back of a quad or a side-by-side -side or anything and hauling it in. That thing is just too damn big. So something smaller is definitely more portable. It's going to be easier for more members of your family to pick it up, move it around. I don't know. I, I still love my big generators, but I decided to take a step back and look at it through some other people's eyes and think, you know what? 
There are instances, there are use cases where a smaller generator can be better. The next one, number four, and this one honestly depends. <laughs> I like that, but number four, smaller generators, all things being equal, tend to be quieter. Now, that's not always the case. You're going to say, Tim, but I know about a small generator that's really loud and it makes all kinds of noise and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know. Again, if you take a big generator, set it next to a small generator, overall, typically, the smaller generators are going to be a little bit quieter. Now, here's where the cheat comes in. Because smaller generators tend to be inverter generators. Inverter generators tend to have more insulation built around them, and they tend to be 15 to 20 decibels quieter. So, that being said, smaller generators, on the average, tend to be a little bit quieter than bigger generators. Now, where is that a concern? If you live in the country, it really doesn't matter. But if you live in the suburbs or in the town like I do, of course, you want to make sure that your generator isn't annoying your neighbors. If you live in a homeowners association, you want to make sure that your backup generator isn't breaking some sort of HOA statute that says you can't have a generator that's more than 65 decibels or we're going to come and fine you $10,000 a day until you get rid of it because you're going to have a bad day if that's the case. And, of course, quieter generator means less attention from other people. So if it's a big, long, protracted power outage, it could be a week, two weeks, or it could just be one day and you got a bunch of nimrods that are going up and down back alleys listening for generators thinking you know what people have their generators out they're desperate it's shitty weather we don't want to come outside we're going to go around listen for generators and we're going to steal one well the louder the generator the more it's going to bring the attention of the ne'er-do-wells that you don't want to deal with so <laughs> i know that might be a bit of an extreme but i'm trying to run all of these points all the way out to their logical conclusion to see why one might consider buying a smaller generator. And the sound in this case is absolutely a big deal. Again, mine isn't too bad. When you're inside, it just kind of sounds like a car running in the backyard. But if sound's a real issue, if you're really close to your neighbors, or, or how about you living in an apartment building and you want to run one out on your balcony? I'm not recommending it necessarily, but I am saying it's a possibility. So if you want to run one out on your balcony, you're going to need something as quiet as you can get. So sometimes, especially in the inverter generator end of things, smaller does equal quieter. Okay, and number five, a smaller generator takes up less storage space. Now, if you've got a great big garage like me, and I keep pointing because my generator is over there behind the, ca the camera, and of course you guys can't see it, but just imagine it. It's over in a tiny little corner of my great big kind of garage doesn't take up a lot of space. Now, if all you have is a small 4x8 storage shed or say a tiny know, 3 by 10 deck on a, um, an apartment balcony or maybe you only have a little storage unit across town, every square foot counts. So when you're looking at saying, oh, I'd really like a big generator like that, but all I got is this tiny little shed and I've got no room to build anything, I've got no room to add on to the shed, then of course, smaller in your case absolutely could be better. You might say, well, I can put one of these little 3000 watt or one of these little suitcase 1500 watt generators right here in the corner because that's the only clear space I have left in my generator. Or it's the only amount of space that I'm willing to give up on my balcony, put a towel over it or a tarp over it and just leave it there. I'm not willing to take up one third of my entire balcony for a great big generator that I'm not going to need anyway. So, smaller, sometimes better, as far as storage goes, that's for sure. And as far as storage space goes, I talked about it being mobile beforehand. Smaller means you're going to take it with you more often, but it also means, like, when I know when we're packing up to go camping with the, uh, the RV, storage space is a minimum. You're not putting it inside the, the RV at all. Basically, all I've got is my five and a half foot box on my Dodge. And again, you get firewood, bikes, the whole works in there. Eventually, you're going to run out of space. So, again, smaller is better. Space is a premium in the back of that box of that truck. And you might not get a great big generator on there, but you might just throw in your suitcase generator. So, like I said, storage space is always a consideration when you're looking at buying a generator. So, guys, this stuff here is broad strokes. There's a lot of, you can get in real in-depth, and you guys, I'm sure, could argue every single one of these points. But there's a few other considerations that we have to make when you're thinking, I might go with a smaller generator. So after you've listened to me yammer on about generators, because you know I love to talk about them, and you think, you know what? 
he might have just talked me into buying a smaller generator. I don't need a bigger generator. What do you need to think about? Well, first off, you need to think, absolutely, what are the bare essentials that I need to run in an emergency? Because if you're going to pick up a smaller generator, you got to realize you're making concessions. There's certain things you're no longer going to be able to run. That's okay. Not an issue. But there's certain things you're not going to be able to run anymore. So you got to figure out what are the absolute drop-dead, non-negotiable items that I need to run in a power outage. Get that all listed. Figure out what the total wattage of all that is. And if it exceeds your smaller generator, think again. Think, well, okay, maybe I can run certain things. Did you add up your furnace, your fridge, your freezer? Now, you might not need all, or and your sump pump. You might only need one of those at a time. You might run your furnace for an hour, turn it off. Run your fridge to get it cooled down again, turn it off. Run your freezer, run your sump pump to pump out the uh, holding container in your basement. So you could cycle a lot of things on and off. It's a little more work, but if you live in an area that just isn't hit by a lot of power outages on a regular basis, a smaller generator cycling through all your major appliances or things that are needed in an emergency might be all that you need. Now, one more thing you might say is, I don't even have enough money yet to get a smaller generator. I'd like to, but something you might not have considered is, of course, do you have a car sitting in your driveway? Do you have one parked there? Do you have access to it on the main floor? You might look at picking up, say, a 1500 watt inverter, which is, works out to about half the price of a small generator, a small cheap generator. You know, you can get them in the hundred, well, in Canada, the hundred to $150 range. So you've already got probably 80 liters, 20 gallons of gas in your fuel tank, something like that anyway. So you've, you know, if you always keep it full, it doesn't cost you any more. This is something that give me a hard time for a long time, but it doesn't cost you any more to keep your car full than it does empty after you filled it the first time. So if you've got a full tank or three quarters of a tank and an inverter, you've got enough stuff there. How long could your car idle for uh, on a full tank of gas? Probably a few days. And if you turn it on and off for a while, you can run quite a bit of stuff off a 15 watt, uh, 1500 watt generator. So maybe consider just looking at a digital inverter generator that you can plug into your car battery and then power some of the items you need off it. So that's something to think about too. So if you're even at the point where I'd love to have a generator, I can't quite afford a smaller generator, look at an inverter you can plug into your battery on your car. All right, so that's it for this week, guys. While I was putting this script together, I got a, a really long uh, message, comment, IM from a community user, Honor Harrington. I'm going to post all that in the description below. It's way more technical than I usually go into. It's awesome information. It's really cool. So check that out if you want to know, take a deeper dive into the size of generators and all of that. I just wanted to touch on the common broad strokes that are really important to everyday preparedness people, somebody looking to get ready for an emergency. So I hope this video helped guys. If you're thinking about, hey, maybe I want to pick up a bigger, smaller generator. I got a, there's a whole playlist of generator videos if you want to know a little bit more about it. So check out my playlist there. And yeah, if you got comments, I love uh, just chatting back and forth dialogue on all this stuff. So throw it in the comments below for me guys. And it'll inspire me to do another video about generators, which you don't have to twist my arm to do that. So if you're new here, hit that subscribe button, guys. And as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we build business, create community, find freedom, and share success. Welcome. It's a Tuesday night. It's a special edition of Talking Tools. You guys all know normally it's on a Sunday evening, but this week we had to move it around. I took a poll, made an executive decision, and decided to throw this out on Tuesday night instead of Friday night. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, and if you're listening to this on a you know recording after the fact, or if you're listening to this on the Weekly Workshop Podcast, thanks for taking the time to drop in and give us a listen. So we're going to do something a little bit different this evening. With all the hurricanes on the go, you guys know I love to talk about generators. I love to talk about emergency preparedness. And I thought this week, why don't we talk about dealing with food, that's storage, cooking, and all the other stuff during an extended power outage. I thought, hey, let's share some of the thoughts we have. And I thought I'd put it together in a list. And you know what I love about lists? Everybody, I don't know, everybody loves lists. If you guys seen Joseph's video this week, you know people love lists. 
And what I like about list is you might come into it and say, you know what? I know everything there is to know about backup power, food storage, cooking, the whole works. But you know what? Every time I go through a list like this, I always learn one thing. And even if I don't necessarily learn something, what ends up happening is the person who's sharing the list or, you know, teaching a little bit ends up inspiring one little nugget to get twisted around in your brain and you think, hey, I know what it is I need to deal with. So without further ado, let's talk about the three issues that you can end up dealing with in an extended power outage. And when it comes to food, you're going to end up either storing it, cooking it, or throwing it. So let's dig in, guys. So the biggest thing that we end up needing to deal with 6,500 views. Yeah, I love that, Joseph. I knew that one was going to blow up. I didn't know it was going to blow up that big, but I'm excited. <laughs> so when we're dealing with a power outage, we got to have a plan in place beforehand. You guys know I'm huge on having plans in place. So number one, make sure you have the gear. And I'm big on all of your gear needing to have multiple uses. So it's no sense in just spending a bunch of money on something that you're only going to use during a power outage. I mean, unless it's a generator, of course, but I love having things that have dual purpose, like a camping stove. You're going to use it while you go camping, but you're also going to use it in a power outage to cook your food. But it's all good and well to have all the gear in the world, but if you don't test it ahead of time, what are you going to do? So make sure you take the time, get all that gear out, test it, run it through its paces, know how to use it. To me, that's a huge thing is knowing how to use all this stuff because we can go and we can spend all the money we want on all the prepping gear we want. And if it doesn't, if we haven't tested it and we haven't taken the time to, to make it work, uh, then we're all going to be, you know, up a creek without a paddle, right? So, you know, I, I was worried about Ted recently because I know he's down in the Florida area and I know the storm came through and I don't know about you, Joseph, if it hit your area or not, but it seemed to have a fairly wide swath, but you know, one thing we always did on the East Coast where I grew up was if you heard there was a chance of a storm coming in a couple of days, I always said one of the things, I think the Weather Network and the grocery stores were in bed together because as soon as people knew there was a storm coming, it was time to stock up. And honestly, we should be prepared ahead of time. But if we know there's a storm coming, it doesn't hurt to get out and pick up a few last minute items that you might need. Look in the fridge, look in the freezer, look on the shelves. Hey, this is the thing I need. Or maybe I could use another five gallon can of gas, or maybe I need, uh, you know, another 24 pack of ramen or whatever it happens to be. Take stock, run out quick, pick up the last few things just to make sure, you know, run through, test everything out, take a little bit of time and say, okay, that's working. That's not working. Cause there's nothing worse than, you know, deciding it's time to cook a hot meal on the, the, uh, cook stove and all of a sudden, ah, shoot, the uh, little propane isn't working or the, the intake nozzles uh, jammed up, whatever it happens to be. Hey, little Klondike, thanks for coming. <laughs> I hope I pronounced that right. It looks like little Klondike outdoor, so I hope it is. And you didn't even get a dropper. I seen you had a rainbow, Joseph, there on a dry day, so <laughs> it is what it is. We ended up getting a real nasty rainstorm here, a little bit of hail on the whole works, so it always makes you think about it, you know? So in a long power outage, like I said, you got three options, store it, cook it, or throw it away. And of course, the best way to store things is where it already is. But there's a ton of different options. My dad always used to love on Christmas, we'd always have way too much pop. And he'd always get a big kick out of the fact that, hey, we can take it and put it out on the back deck because it's cold outside. So one thing you can do, if you got a bunch of coolers, always good to have on hand anyway. And if it happens to be a cold time of the year, pack them full of ice and snow. Now, if it happens to be, say, the summer, always have a source for ice to know where you can get ice quickly. Now, for me, I got mm, two garages around here that sell ice. I've got about 17 liquor stores in my little town. Now, three liquor stores that have ice and a water shop that has ice. So as long as you know where you can get ice on a short period of time, then get it going. I just skirted to the east. I'm just getting my stuff together in case. Hey, I'd rather be prepared and not need it than need it and not be prepared, right? So, <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, number one, I mean, oh, hey, Chris, how are you? Nice to see you as well. Man, we got a good little crowd in here. I didn't know how many people we'd end up having on a Tuesday evening because, well, you know, decided to take the weekend and go away with the family. We had a good time, but 
eh, you know what? I wanted to do this so that I could get it out in time for the podcast too. So yeah, so coolers are nice, always a good thing, but you got to think outside the box. So if it is cold outside and you're trying to keep your house warm, well, maybe it's time to move some stuff out to the deck or pack it in coolers, pack it with ice, snow, the whole works. Moving blankets on your freezer. So number one, if you've already got stuff in your freezer and you don't want it to go bad, oh, I never thought of that. And you know what else? I've been known to uh, drop in back, back in the day when uh, things were much tighter than they are now. My daughter and I took an entire trip across country and we made all our food ahead of time, sandwiches and the whole works. And to keep it cold, I would just kind of pull into a hotel in the middle of the afternoon with some really big freezer bags. And I know this is maybe kind of on, uh, anyway, we'd go in, I just walk in like I owned the place, find the ice maker, fill the bags full of ice and walk out. And nobody ever said anything to me. So <laughs> that's always an option too. So if you ever need ice, hotels are another one. Restaurants are a really good one. And hey, if you go in and buy a drink at McDonald's, there's nothing saying that you can't take a cup or two of ice with you as well, or whatever, you know, there's always sources to find ice. And I like that about the restaurants. And I've even been told on occasion that you might even be able to walk into a hotel on a, you know, um, certain times of the busy morning and just have breakfast, not saying <laughs> that that's ethical or anything, just saying that I've heard it's been done. But for us, we did, we would pop into hotels sometimes. And even on occasion, I, I just go to the desk and say, Hey, we're traveling through. Do you mind if I grab a little bit of ice? And most times they really didn't care. But yeah, so freezers, I know you guys have heard this one before, but uh, Harbor Freight's got those moving blankets. I buy them at Princess Auto up here in Canada. Um, still almost as cheap, not quite as good as um, Harbor Freight giving them away, but they're a great added insulation for freezers. Fridges, not so much, but any of the freezers that, you know, the cold air wants to come up and out, great. And you guys know that I'm a big fan of the Go V freezer alarms. And the absolute worst thing you can do when there's a power outage is keep opening your freezer to see, oh, is it cold enough? Is it not cold enough? So get yourself a good, uh, the one I have now is the, the Go V and I love it. <laughs> Joseph says people do it at the hotel all the time. And yeah, I absolutely believe that. They, people just come in, get ice, whatever. And most people don't care because it's making ice either way. But have a freezer alarm so that you don't have to you know, empty things out or, you know, open it up and let all the cold air out. Uh, back, oh man, about 20, just about 20 years ago when I finished college, I was working at a Dairy Queen and we had a huge power outage and we had ice cream cakes there. I like my ice cream. <laughs> and they had those great big glass fronted freezers that we displayed all the cakes in. And we had, I think it was a rule, like one hour and the cakes were no good. So, we took all the cakes, all the dilly bars, all the buster bars, and they were going to go in the garbage. I took them all home, put them in mom and dad's deep freeze. We wrapped them in blankets and they stayed good in there for almost two days till the power come back on. And we were eating free Dairy Queen ice cream. It was a little bit freezer burnt because it melted ever so slightly, but I bet you we ate free Dairy Queen ice cream for uh, almost a year afterwards. And I'm sure it shows, although, <laughs> you know, but yeah, so freezer blankets or, uh, freezer. Oh my, Tim, what is wrong with you tonight? Moving blankets on top of a freezer. And then you guys know generators, they're always, they're, they're, they're the absolute must have when you're dealing with keeping food frozen, cold, whatever it happens to be in the, uh, you know, big, bad power outage. I talk about generators all the time, but what do we need to have fuel on hand, multiple types of fuel if you can. Uh, and if you can't afford a generator or you're just not you know, you don't have the room to store a generator and you got a great big car, truck, whatever it happens to be out in the yard, 1500 watt inverter will, oh, just purchase. And let's put this guy up here. Just purchased a 24,000, well, 24 kilowatt generator, hoping to get it all hooked up for the next hurricane. Now that have to be enough to run your central air. The one I have, whatever, I mean, it is what it is, but I, I haven't tested it yet. My uh, tri-fuel tops out at 92, 9,300 watts, but running on natural gas, it's down around 6,500. But uh, Klondike, you got to fill me in down the road on how well the generator is, what you bought, and what all you want to run with it. Because, hey, if we're backed up like this with a good generator, we're all set. But like I said, if you can't quite afford a full generator, an inverter, 1,500 watt hooked up to the car, man, you can run a microwave, a coffee maker, a hot plate. And you know what? If you guys ever go into like... I love it, especially in the States. You guys have so much better uh, truck stops down there than we do. But man, they're like, 
they're like a 12 foot a 12 volt shopping center at some of those uh circle k's or not circle k uh, flying j's that's what it is you go in there and you get to see some 12 volt stuff you never even thought existed you know coffee makers which are you know but basically if you have a 1500 watt inverter that you can plug in to any vehicle that you have and you got a full tank of gas man you can heat your food cook your food or you know maybe even power a small fridge or a freezer enough to keep everything good for the length of time you need it so i mean like i said the first thing that you deal with in a big power outage is just keep it stored now i mean you know two three four days if you're careful if you have a little bit of backup power even if you don't you can usually keep cold food cold frozen food frozen but then eventually you get to the point where it's like all right it's time i got to deal with it and you got to eat too right so <laughs> So, you know, store it for as long as you can and then cook it and eat it, I guess, is where we go from there. Now, these are all, oh, let's see what it says here. Klondike says, I was told it would run both units, just has a priority switch, so both units won't start at the same time. I'll let you know if it works, as my electrician promised. <laughs> awesome. And I, I've heard about something I learned the other day, too, was, um, and maybe you guys all know about this, but I believe it's a soft start, uh, a soft start unit for central air units. So basically it causes it to not have that huge high spike that can shut a generator down or do damage to it. It helps it kind of slowly start as opposed to just kick in. So if anybody's looked into that kind of thing, let me know too, because that might be just enough to allow me to run my central air off my unit. So yeah, the next thing, like I said, dealing with food, power outage, you got to eat. So I figured I'd put together a list of a bunch of stuff that I'd already have around the house think outside the box, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, to a bunch of things you already have that you can turn around and use in a power outage too. And you guys know I'm a huge fan of dual purpose items. I hate buying. It's like, you know, the people that say, I'm going to put together a bug out bag and it's going to lie. I'm only going to use it when the shit hits the fan and EMP has gone off and I'm going to go live in the woods. And I've got $12,000 worth of gear in that bag. And it's no good for nothing except in the absolute worst case scenario. I'm not like that. I mean, you know, whatever. So first one, camping stove. Anybody who likes to camp probably has a little Coleman stove or a little propane stove. And those things are absolutely incredible for, you know, just getting your food heated up. And remember, keep a bunch of one pound tanks on hand. And then there's a couple other little things that I keep around. And that's a, a one to 20 pound adapter hose. So I've got like, I want to say it's a 10 foot hose that we use for our uh, outback fire pit when we're sitting we just sit around and en enjoy it <laughs> get to keep all that butcher box meat cold ain't that the truth with klondike <laughs> i'm putting that one up there so everybody can see it there we go yes got to keep so again a lot of us i'm sure some of us anyway have gone keto i've been doing pretty good although the last couple of weeks hey ted nice to see you buddy i hope uh is it ida i hope ida's stayed far away from you but yeah, so a big thing about going low carb is the fact that you got to have a lot of protein and a lot of meat on hand. We've got three freezers uh, just behind me in the other room in the basement, and you got to keep it cold. I mean, once it's in there, a good big thermal mass in the deep freeze is going to make a huge difference. And again, keep it all cold. That's why I have a generator because there's a huge investment. I've got a half a beef and a quarter of a beef, so a side and a, a front quarter all in the one deep freeze. And man, I do not want to end up losing that. So yeah, camps. Oh yeah. So camp stove, uh, I've got a, a one to 20 pound adapter hose. So it goes from those little tiny, um, I don't know what you want to call it, but basically the little threaded adapters that work for the one pound tanks. And it goes out to the regular, the regulator on a 20 pound, 30 pound, whatever propane tank that lets you save a ton of money let you tap into all that propane that you probably already have uh, stored anyway. So that works. Now, another thing that I've done is uh, pick up a refill adapter. So if you guys haven't seen those and you don't have room to store a lot of big propane tanks, or for whatever reason, you just want to keep the one pounders around, number one, go through any campground the end of the weekend, you're going to find a ton of empty one pound tanks. And those things have gotten damn expensive. I don't know if you guys have, I think, man, I want to say they're six or $7 a piece right now in Canada, which is probably like 45 cents in the States, but, you know, go and pick a bunch of them up 
and look for the little one pound refill adapters. And, you know, if you have one 20 pound tank, make, get yourself familiar with the system on how to refill them, but it works easy. You basically just need one needs to be cold, one needs to be warm, invert the propane tank and they fill. They're great. I've done it. Um, I've done it for a lot of my relatives who use those uh, one pounders a lot, but just become familiar with the process ahead of time so you can have that on hand. Now, who doesn't love to grill? <laughs> I'm sure we all think about it, but I mean, if you've already got a barbecue and you're sitting around thinking, well, I don't know how I'm going to cook. I don't have my uh, microwave here to heat up my hot pockets. <laughs> no, none of us are hot pocket eaters, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, if you got a grill outside, number one, make sure you got propane on hand. And something else that I found, I've switched over. I don't know if you guys have looked at them a whole lot, but the 30-pound tanks, they take up just as much floor space as a 20-pound tank. And Costco sells them, and they're not that much more. And once you have the investment, you've got 50% uh, more storage capacity already there. But better yet, uh, I just uh, I recently bought a new barbecue, and I made sure that it was convertible to natural gas. So if you've got that hooked up, and one thing I'm sure you guys notice, power goes out, at least in my area. I've lived here in Alberta now for just about eight years. And we have about once a year power outage that's somewhat serious, you know, of, of a length that you actually remember. Had one the other night, right through the night, and I slept through most of it. But in the eight years I've lived here, we haven't had a single natural gas outage in my town. There was one in a neighboring town an hour away for about a day, and it was really serious. But that was the only one that I've heard of in any kind of radius of my area in eight years. So if you can get tied into natural gas in any way, shape, or form, if you have it in your area, it's a godsend because that is like power when there is no power. So yeah, anyway, so a teapot and a French press. Uh, anybody, there's something about when the power's out, about being able to have a hot drink. I just love, have, <laughs> I don't know. I, I remember back before I was married, I want to say, I'm, I think I was working at Dairy Queen at the time and we had, that was that same power outage that we ended up getting all the free ice cream cakes from all i wanted was a cup of tea lost power for th oh my god <laughs> three weeks after wilma uh, the longest i've ever had has been about three and a half days i don't know what i'd have done ted i mean I, we would have made do we're, we're we're better prepared than you know the average bear but still it is what it is but when it's cold or damp or shitty weather out there's nothing better than having a nice hot drink so having a teapot you can boil on an open fire, on a grill, you know, anything like that. Uh, sure beats having a Keurig, having a French press that you can just boil water in and then, you know, push it down through and have a hot cup of coffee. There is nothing better. It, I don't know. It just soothes the soul to be able to have a hot drink when the power's out. So make sure you got a way to do that. I mean, most of us do. I'm probably preaching to the choir, but this is the type of video that I want to be there for everybody. So someone else who's never done this before can come here and say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And hey, learn how to use a French press because it's something, I know it sounds simple. I hadn't even seen it used before, like about a year ago. And now I'm almost obsessed with them. I think they're pretty cool. So yeah, know how to use that gear. I mean, if you can't boil a teapot, then you know. <laughs> so little Klondike said, same here after Hurricane Delta, about three weeks. I can't imagine. And Joseph said, went, went through a few in North Carolina myself, Bertha, Fran, not sure of others, but those two left an impression. So in my area where I grew up on the East Coast in Nova Scotia, we had a hurricane in the wintertime. It was uh, on Groundhog's Day, and it was before my time, but it was bad enough that there was saltwater spray coming from the opposite coast over 100 miles away, and it washed out the road that my dad uh, basically... Where my dad lived is there's only one road in and out to get up the coast and it washed it out and they were, I think it was five or six days without a road and they were well over two weeks without power. This was in the late seventies and you know, they barely skipped a beat. They still had an outhouse. They did have a deep freeze, but they wrapped it in blankets. And he said, I think those were, you know, made out of asbestos back in the day. So, I mean, they were good for, you know, they, they had no issues. And I think that's maybe one of the big problems is that too many people now just aren't used to making do without. And I guess this is kind of one of my passions is saying, hey, listen, 
It's not nearly as hard as you think. It doesn't cost you nearly as much as you think. And you can get by really well in some bad situations pretty easily. No power for a month changes. What's that? Yeah. No power for a month changes life a lot. Eight from a Red Cross truck. Every, holy cow, Joseph. <laughs> That's insane. So you were an entire month without power. I can't even imagine. And uh, Ted says, little Klondike outdoors makes you really appreciate the small things in life we typically take for granted. Ain't that the truth? Like a hot shower, for instance. I never even thought about that, but we'll we'll deal with that another day. <laughs> so uh, another thing, uh, we like to sit around the fire pit in the backyard. Ours is a propane one, but you might have a wood one as well. And again, I, I always think it's kind of funny, you know, you hear the story of people starving with food all around them or you know, drying out without any, with water all around them. And it's the same. If you've got literally no way to cook, but you've got, oh, a fire pit where the kids roast wieners and make s'mores out of it. Well, hell, why don't you get out there and build yourself a fire? I mean, that's maybe the worst case scenario, but again, what do we do? Practice making fires and learn how to do it. Keep dry tinder on hand, keep wood on hand, <laughs> keep matches and lighters on hand. And everybody, some people might say, oh, but lighters, they're a cheat. No, no, no. There's no such thing as a cheat when it comes to preparedness. Whatever makes life easier for you, man, just, just do it. Stock up on the lighters. You guys have seen, I got some recommendations on a couple I really like, but yeah, I mean, just know how to build a damn fire. If you got a fire pit, and even if you don't have a fire pit, if it's a real bad situation, you can always improvise. <laughs> if you got an old tire ring around, there's a hundred things. Dig a hole, surround it in rocks and light a fire, you know? Worst case scenario, you don't need to worry about HOA regulations in a real bad situation like that. So how about a wood stove? Now, this is one, this was bigger on the East Coast than it is on the prairies, but I'm sure a few of you guys have one, and I would love to get one just for a backup source of heat out here. But as you can imagine, wood on the prairies is a, a little bit, you know, expensive, <laughs> cost prohibitive, right? But um so if you got a wood stove and it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, a five thousand dollar enamel plated, uh, you know, wood cook range, it can be just a simple old black box made out of cast iron that you heat your house with. But you know, keep a supply of seasoned wood on hand. Um, what I love about it though is you can cook on those things. Man, we used to put a, a pot of stew on top of the wood stove and just leave it all day long. And there's nothing better than a long, slow cooked stew. And man, you get, you put a, um, a pot of stew and a teapot next to that. And man, you can eat and drink like a king for days without even having to worry about it. And it's an uh, emergency backup source of heat too. Now, of course, if it's summertime, I'd probably be outside grilling as opposed to being on the, the wood stove, but always something to think about. <laughs> so let's, Always during the hot, humid, mosquito-infested time of the year, too, takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> Add in 20 inches of rain, and those can... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ain't that an awful thing? Yeah. Oh, I hate mosquitoes to begin with. Um, I'm trying to... Th anyway, the, we, we have those little round... I don't even... I got to look up the name. I'll put it in the comments afterwards. But, man, they have been the best mosquito repellents. They've got a little... Um, propane butane type thing in them and a little sheet and those things have been incredible my wife bought them and, and they work so now here's one that not everybody thinks about and i was brainstorming some notes for this video and if you get yourself an rv you basically got a self-contained cooking unit right there so if you got an rv and you need to keep things cold or cool thermocell oh i wish i <laughs> Joseph beat Ted to it. Everybody else already knew anyway, so that's good. Yes, Thermocell, that's it. And those things work like the cat's ass. And I just bought a bulk pack of like 48 of those. Uh, I don't know even know what they're called. The little ticket you put in them and a dozen of the uh, butane cells. But man, they're they're awesome. Yeah, I, I love them. And they really, really do work. What do they say? Great minds think alike or fools think alike. I can't remember, Ted. It's one of those two, you know? <laughs> so yeah, if you got an RV... You've already got a fridge and a freezer that are going to run on propane. Now, they take a little while to get up and running. So if you know that you might have a power outage coming, it wouldn't hurt to have that plugged in and get it cold and cool and running already. So then you can just turn around and have it running off of propane when the power goes out. Because that's what I do when we're ready to go away for the weekend. I get it cold with electrical, and then it doesn't take nearly as much fuel to get it up and get it going. 
and I did not know that there was a USB charging one. Now, that is something to do a review on. Oh, let's see what Chris has to say. I like this. Built, oh, I'm going to bring it up here on the screen so this old man can read it better. Built a small-scale rocket mass in the basement. Basement. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Stuttered for a minute. We ran it last week and about cooked ourselves out of the house on six sticks. I would have liked to seen a video on that, Chris. That is really cool. Now, did you, by the name of White North Forge, did you have to weld to make it or was it just something that you kind of built um, you know, on, on the fly? Because I'd love, to, either way, if you got pictures or video, I'd love to see it. But yeah, so back to the RV thing. The other thing, of course, is you got a propane stove in there. Now, last time we upgraded all of our appliances, we stuck with electrical. I wish we'd have gone to natural gas, but that's a story for another day. Uh, we were in the middle of a pandemic at the time, and it really, uh, we didn't have much of a choice on the appliances we bought. So yeah, anyway, so an RV, like I said, you can sleep in there, you've got heat, you've got anything you can run off propane, you're all set. So that that's a good way to do it. And of course, if you got to eat during a powered, yeah, I got to look into those USB thermocells. Sorry. Yeah, I think that was a squirrel ran by there. I got distracted for a second. But <laughs> So shelf stable food, you can eat out of a can, have a good quality can opener, like the easy does it one. You guys know I recommend that it's American made. Oh, anyway, this isn't a commercial, but I love that damn can opener. Anybody else has used it? It works. Or, um, there's a, a YouTuber that I watch that eats weird things out of a can and he absolutely hates pull tab cans, but Hey, for us prepared and minded people, if you, it reminds me of the old um, Twilight Zone episode where the guy finally had all the time in the world to read, but he broke his glasses. So if you've, you know, if you've got, if it's finally time to eat all your damn canned food that you've been saving for 10 years and you don't have a can opener, you got to have a way to open it. So the pull tabs, they're not so bad. And my daughter, Alice, I love her so much. She has taken to wanting to eat MREs. So every time we go to the city, <laughs> we end up buying a full case of MREs from the local uh, Army Surplus store. And so if you buy the ones with the heaters, some of the Canadian meals don't have the heaters. Some of them do, so you got to check. But if you have them with those, uh, I guess they're a chemical reaction heater. I don't know exactly how they work yet. I haven't really dug into them, but we've been taste testing them. I might even do a video on uh, those XMRE meals because they're kind of cool. But yeah, so if you've got uh, a case or two of them stashed away, you can have a hot meal, a hot drink without any need of, you know, heating anything up whatsoever other than those, uh, I don't want to call them built in, but included MRE food heaters. And then of course, when we're dealing with food, there's always the thought of water. So you either need to have stored water or you need to have a way to filter water because if the power's out and it may not happen right away, but your municipal water might, <laughs> mm, surplus MREs. Some are really good and some weren't so good. We, we worked our way through a case of breakfast ones a couple of weeks ago and they were kind of fun. Uh, there was a uh, hash brown and sausage combination that I really liked. Some of the Canadian ones aren't even freeze dried anymore. They're just vacuum sealed. So they only have a shelf life of like 18 months to 24 months, but man, the quality on them are top notch. Uh, and then some of the new ones we just got are freeze dried. So we'll, we'll try them out. But yeah, I mean, that's an easy way to have a hot meal that literally requires almost no work whatsoever. So yeah, back to the idea of water, of course. So if you've got food you want to eat, you got to stay hydrated. So we got to figure out a way to store it. Um, and so that you're not digging into your water resources, because of course, I mean, most times when the power goes out, the water doesn't go out too, but it's always something to think about. So keep a, I like to save up disposable plates and forks, that kind of stuff from whenever we get takeout, I throw them up in a cupboard. I'm like an old man who, you know, my wife, she, when we go to a hotel, she saves all the soaps and the shampoos. And for me, when we order Chinese or something like that, I save all the condiments, all the paper, every bit. Oh yeah. So I was at Costco the other day and they had some of those life straws. And I, of course, what do you do now when you see something like that? But you go on Amazon and you look and you say, oh yeah, I can get it there as well. So a lot of times I find Costco's price, I've seen it was a three pack, I believe. Anyway, the price was about the same. I almost picked some up. I didn't. Uh, I've got my Berkey. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you know about Berkey's, but if you don't, Man, they are, they look good in the, in the kitchen and they last friggin' forever. I use them all the time. I think it's about time to clean my filter because they're getting a little slow, 
but you got to have a way to store water. So whether it's pop bottles, five gallon jugs, whether it's a rain barrel outside, the Berkey will take care of it. But if not, you know, we, we've got a local place here that you can fill five gallon jugs for a buck 50. Fill as many as you can, keep them on hand because you got to have water. And then use your disposable stuff, throw them away so you're not wasting it on hygiene and that kind of stuff. Um, and again, it's always one of them, you know, there's all, not the myth, but people say you can always melt snow or ice for water if you need it. Bathtub, Ted. Yep, I remember <laughs> back when I was, let's see, 2000. So January, or, uh, December 31st on the new millennium, we went out, me and my buddy, and we bought a, a case of water. And we thought, oh, this is pretty good. And then we're like, well, just in case the shit really does hit the fan and we're in trouble, I filled my bathtub too. So <laughs> it was probably full of friggin' you know, shampoo residue and everything, but we had the water just in case. We were going to survive off a case of water, probably a case of ramen noodles and a bathtub full of nasty, grimy old water, but there's always a way. And that's a great one, Ted. And I always forget about that. If there's a chance, that, if there's a really good chance that you got a bad power outage coming or even just a bad storm, fill the bathtub. There's even these bladders you can buy. I'm sure they're overkill, but you put them in the tub and they work as a storage for water when the power goes out or, you know, and it keeps it clean, whatever. They're good. They're nice to have. I don't know if they're necessarily necessary or not, but you know, it is. And again, snow, ice, you can always melt that if you absolutely have to, but uh, it's a lot of work. But if you're in a real bad way, it never hurts. So then from there, of course, you know, hopefully we've been working through a lot of our food and we've been eating a lot of our food the worst, the absolute worst thing a person has to do is throw it away. And sometimes that may be the nasty thing that we have to do. But if you try really hard, you know, always think about it. Start cooking everything in your fridge first. Eat up everything you can. Your sandwich meats, make sandwiches, eat that up quick because that's the nasty shit. There's nothing real in it and it's going to go bad on you. But, you know, your fridge holds the cold the least. Then your fridge freezer is next because, again, it's smaller, not as insulated as well. And then leave your deep freeze alone as long as you possibly can. So hopefully you've got, you know, backup power and you never have to worry about this. But if we've, you know, if we've explored all our backup power um, that we, we can, we have no gas left, whatever it happens to be, or maybe it's just been so long that we can't keep it cold anymore, then you got to have a plan. What are you going to do with the rotten meat? And that, it's always meat, right? Because that's the thing that goes bad. You know, you re, I read a bunch of articles on this again, just to refresh myself. And they always said, hey, don't worry about cheese. Throw it on the shelf. It's going to be fine. Eggs, if they're farm fresh eggs, geez, they'll last 30 days on top of a fridge. You don't even have to worry about them. Store-bought eggs, they say they're an issue. You know what? If they're bad and you're not sure, put them in a glass. If they sink, they're good. If they float, they're bad. There you go. Um, keep a digital thermometer around so you can check things to make sure they haven't gone too far bad, but your sniffer is always the best thing. So, <laughs> but again, what are you going to do if you've got to the point where shit, my meat's gone bad. I got to get rid of it. Well, number one, if you got one of them rolling garbage tubs, like I have here that we, you know, the town uses, throw it all in there and get it as far away from the house as you can, because the last thing you need is somebody end up getting sick from all that meat and all that smell and all that nastiness. So have a plan. If you can't, where do you go from there? Maybe Rubbermaids, tape them shut. Like if you're in a, a high rise, well, I hate to say high rise, but if you're in an apartment or something, you got to deal with it, you know, Rubbermaids, put them in garbage bags, put them in Rubbermaids, tape the Rubbermaid shut, and then put garbage bags around that. Whatever you can do to keep the smell from attracting critters, attracting flies, anything you can. But do what you can to either get it as far away from you. I guess you could even bury it if you absolutely had to. But this is like way out there. But I mean, if you're looking at a week, but then some people, you know, all they have is a fridge and a freezer in their little apartment and it doesn't take long for that stuff to spoil. And then you got to have a plan for how am I going to get rid of it? Because I can't deal with the smell. I can't deal with the, uh, the hygiene issues of it. And I certainly don't want to have critters coming along. So you got to have a plan for getting rid of all that stuff. So, Again, plan ahead, think about it. Don't spend a lot of time fretting on the idea of, hey, all my meat's going to go bad, all my food's going to go bad, but just have a plan in the back of your head. If that happens, this is how I'm going to get rid of it. And then I thought, you know what? Uh, I just threw this in at the end, but I, uh, I had uh, five favorite foods for power outages and stuff like that. And there's a bunch of things that either 
don't take a lot of work or they're just simple and you can use them on some of these <clears throat> off-grid kind of things. But number one is overnight oats. So if you've got no power whatsoever, but you got some milk or even just water and some brown sugar, just put the oats in the container. You can add some maybe canned fruit or something and just let it sit all night. And man, they are scrumptious. I don't eat a lot of oats anymore, but it's a great meal to make if you know you're not going to have any way to heat stuff for a long time. So just kind of room temperature oats with some milk or some powdered milk and water. Let them sit overnight, add some fruit, and you're good to go. Hey, Jaggy. Man, that, oh, well, you guys, we haven't seen Jaggy in here before, but Jaggy is one of my friends. He just said, Tim, is it okay when this video is saved? Can I put it up on my Facebook pages and groups? Absolutely, Jaggy. Pass my love to the girls. Jaggy's a good friend of mine. I met him on Zello years ago, and uh, he's got a bit of a Scottish accent, don't you, Jaggy? But <laughs> And my girls think the world of him. Every time we're on Zello, they always ask, how's Jaggy doing? So it's good to see you, man. And yes, absolutely put this up there. I would love that. So another one that we do, and if you guys haven't heard of it, I love them. They're called hobo meals. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're allowed to call them hobo meals anymore. But when we're camping and we have a campfire, you basically take a hamburger patty, slice up some onion, put some carrots in there, some butter, some salt and pepper, some potatoes, and you just throw the whole thing wrapped in heavy duty tinfoil down in the fire and let it cook. And there is almost nothing better. <laughs> Thanks, Jaggy. Man, I love you. It's nice to see you, buddy. But yeah, so just cook them all wrapped up in heavy duty tinfoil and it they my kids love them sometimes throw a little ketchup on them afterwards whatever but that's good and don't ever forget about a good old-fashioned wiener roast if you got a bunch of hot dogs you know or sausages or whatever it happens to be and you all you got's a fire pit get out there and freaking have fun make a game out of it enjoy it with the kids and then back in my college days we used to have i don't even know what we used to call it maybe bread night or something basically we'd all pitch in two or three bucks and we'd go down to the a local grocery store and we'd buy usually a couple packages of bread that's about to expire some kind of weird cheap cheese whatever we could find and then we'd buy the cheapest meat that we could find on clearance and it usually was chopped up stewing beef <laughs> so we'd take stew and beef and some salt and pepper packets and we'd go out and we'd have a campfire by the river and we would just roast stewing beef and, you know, nobody ever dropped dead from a coal eye or anything like that. And it was a, it was a good meal. I mean, I know this is really simple, but man, it was, it was awesome. I loved it. And I see Ted said canned peaches. I missed that. Sorry, man. But yeah, absolutely. Canned peaches are awesome to mix in with that uh, overnight oats. I'm going to put Jaggy's comment up there so nobody misses it. But yeah, so stewing beef on a stick, man, we used to roast it just like marshmallows. And I, I loved it. It's one of my favorite things we used to do. And then I would absolutely be amiss if I didn't mention my dad's world famous camp toast. So whenever we would go back in the woods to the hunting camp, my uncle has an awesome deer hunting camp where more eating gets done than shooting of deer. Uh, I'm not sure there's been a deer shot there in over a decade, but we still call it the hunting camp. So that's all right. <laughs> anyway, my dad always calls it. He says, you got to go back. We got to have camp toast. <laughs> and it's literally, we have um, a propane um cooktop stove back there that we all love and all it is is you take the bread and you toast it on the open flame and i don't know why i don't know if it's a mix between the you know the off gases of the propane or the char or whatever but even when we go camping now the kids always say we got to have grampy cooks camp toast and it's so simple but if you have an open flame you just toast your bread on it it might get a little charred it might not be you know as good as, say, an egg waffle and an electric toaster for the kids that really love it. But camp toast is absolutely where it's at when it comes to that. It I, I love it. It's simple. So I don't know if anybody else has any recommendations for simple camping things that you'd love to get into this video because anything like that that is easy that we forget about because, man, after your two, three, four days into a power outage, you absolutely, a hot meal can just lift your spirits. And I don't know what it is. It's just, you know, if, if you have light when it's dark and you have warmth when it's cold, it just makes you feel like a human again. And and that's sometimes all it takes is to get through a power outage is like, oh yeah, I had a hot meal. And sometimes it's as simple as throwing some toast or, well, it's not toast when it starts, but sometimes it's as simple as 
putting bread on an open flame and having camp toast or having one of Tim's world famous hobo meals. <laughs> mm, gas toast. It's just, oh, see, I'm glad. Now I got to tell my dad that you call it gas toast because he'll enjoy, enjoy that. But dad would always say that gas toast is the type of toast that gives him gas afterwards, which is basically anything because we give him a keychain that says he's the world's largest source of natural gas. So there is that. But yes, gas toast, camp toast. I love it. There's nothing better. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a hundred different things, but I wanted to put together, I don't know, just kind of a resource. I, I love doing this stuff. It's kind of my passion when it comes to, you know, simple preparedness without being crazy and thinking the world's going to end because there's enough people out there doing that. But this is the type of thing that people can really dive into, you know, throw in a couple of stories. People love to hear about me being an idiot once in a while, filling my bathtub and that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's always some really cool stuff. And what I like is as you go along, you guys throw out ideas to me and we can share them because as far as the community goes, this is what I love. It's the, the shared information and all of that. So if anybody's watching this down the road and it's a recording, well, obviously, because if it's down the road, it's not live, Tim, <laughs> throw in the comments, any other suggestions you guys might have for other meals, or you know what, if I forgot, I'm sure somebody's sitting there beating their head against the wall saying, Tim, you forgot this. You're an idiot. Why did you, or, or don't do that. And yeah, while we're talking, one thing a person needs to have is some sort of carbon monoxide detector. Uh, I've been looking for a battery one. So if anybody can point me in the right direction, I'd like to have one that I can include in my blackout bag, but I'd also like to have one for this kind of thing, because anytime you're introducing, you know, burning of fuels and that sort of thing in an enclosed environment, it can be dangerous. Um, I had a friend a few years ago, burnt their house down or at least, sorry, an acquaintance who ran a generator in their, uh, porch covered porch and caught the house on fire and burn it down. So that's always a possibility too. So a good smoke detector, but anytime you're dealing with this kind of, I don't know, like emergency preparedness type thing and you're cooking or heating, anything like that, safety is a good thing too. So have a couple of, um, fire extinguishers or, you know, my, that fire spray stuff around. I love it, but yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I, I'd like to do more in this series. Um, I really, really enjoy putting this together. It's always fun. Um, like I said, normally we do this on Sunday night when everybody's around. Uh, <laughs> thumbs up from Ted. Thanks, Ted. You know, I always appreciate it. Tuesday seems to have worked really good for people too. But um, what did I want to tell you real quick about this week? Uh, my fall jobs are starting to book up like crazy. I love it. Um, I, I know uh, Ford's not on here tonight, but if you guys ever see Ford through here, he always laughs because I call gutters eaves troughs. And so my gutter jobs or my eaves troughs cleaning, I think I've got almost 10 booked already and we're like a month out. Um, so yeah, it was, it is what it is. Uh, just spent an awesome weekend away with my family just before school starts back up again. We had a great time, went away and did something that's super important to preparedness. I went to the dentist and got the last of my fillings done. It'd been a few years and I think we made four trips to the dentist and I am now uh, cavity free. So that is important because who knows when a worldwide pandemic is going to shut down the dentist's office again and you might have a real bad issue and you got to get it dealt with. So that's done. Uh, something else, look after your back guys. Man, I want to tell you, I we moved to dentist a few months ago and I wrecked my back pretty good. I thought I did permanent damage. I got lucky and I didn't. But my wife finally talked me into going to the old back cracker and I hadn't had much, um, I don't know, I didn't put much stock in going to a chiropractor, but I want to tell you, he is my go-to now. Within three or four sessions, he had me feeling about 95% better. And then I went and frigged it all up here. Uh, but a week ago, uh, my wife and I bought a hot tub, uh, a nice, fairly new, almost new, but used. We picked it up. I need to stay up later in Sundays when you do more lives instead of 3 a.m. Oh, my dental health is very, <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely true. So we went and we hired a picker to pick up this hot tub, but we had to get a strap under it and dumb ass me. I thought oh, I'll pick it up and I went to lift up on the corner. And as soon as I did, I felt whatever it was go on my back again. And I, it was bad, but I didn't go to the chiropractor. And then two days later, we did a big move for a lady and I was in the most pain I've ever been. Anyway, this isn't a, you know, um, feel sorry for Tim kind of session. I just want to let you know, if you've ever hurt your back, 
go see a chiropractor first because I seriously thought I must have ruptured a disc or something and he fixed me up so good. So don't ever be scared to try something new. I was, I was because I was stuck in my ways. And when I went to the chiropractor, I want to tell you, man, he fixed me up. And then one other thing I wanted to mention, I'm sure you guys probably all saw it, but if you didn't, uh, our community member of the month spotlight is Carrie Brown of Strong Roots Resources. I always get tongue tied on that for some reason, but if you haven't checked him out, check out Monday's uh, video. It was a really cool spotlight on him. He did a review. Hey, John, I didn't see you in here. Yes, I you know what? I don't know. Anyway, it's good to have that. I go in every two weeks for a tune-up. <laughs> I love that. That is the truth. And again, I guess another kind of preparedness type thing is have a good health plan. Uh, everybody says, oh, Canada's health care is free. Well, it's not free. It's taxpayer paid. But man, all it covers is the basics. And we have, uh, again, on uh, go off on a tangent here, but the fact that I started a business and now my wife started a business, allowed us to legally have two health plans that we're covered on. It gives us, it allows us to double dip and we're covered for things like the chiropractor at hundred percent. So man, I'm telling you, if you ever think, oh, I don't know if I should start a business, it's worth it. The benefits on the other end are so incredible. And now we've got like 10 or 12, <laughs> hey, Charlie, that's my, my daughter, Charlotte there too. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay, sweetie. I bet you were playing Fortnite, weren't you? <laughs> anyway, yeah. So if you guys are ever thinking about getting into entrepreneurship or starting an entrepreneurial venture, there's so many benefits. But like I said, we've got a ton of people that are all on this health plan now, family members and everything that has helped everybody out. So anyway, that's just a whole nother thing. A good chiropractor is worth their weight in gold, as is an acupuncturist. So I've... Charlotte, I don't know if you see Jaggy there, but it's nice to see him in here tonight. So if anybody else has tried acupuncture, that's something else I would love to. I, I've never had to yet. I, I'd totally be worth trying it. Um, I think my daughter went once and she she cried and didn't really enjoy it, but I would totally be down for that. I, I would definitely. All right, guys. 48 minutes in. I try to keep it to 45 minutes. I know you just showed up, Charlotte, and I love you, but <laughs> my voice is starting to go tonight. We'll see where we end up. But so guys, if you uh, don't know, or you're new here, or you're listening to this on the recording, normally Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Mountain Time, which I don't even know how to translate that into Scottish time, Jaggy. I apologize. <laughs> but yeah, 8 p.m. Sunday night, almost every week, it... Um, I just love it. I, this is the highlight of my week now, guys. I love getting in here and checking in with everybody in the community. So thanks for dropping by, guys. And as always, you know what it is. Stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. Thanks again, guys, for dropping by the weekly workshop. A new edition drops every week, so keep an eye out. And if you're looking for a solution to such problems as... I spilled paint on vinyl siding, or I can't get this heavy picture to stay on the wall, stop by toolmantim.co and check out the Today's Tool section, where I share products and tools that have either made me money or saved me money personally or in my long-running year-round handyman business. And if you found value in this content, please take a moment and share it on your social platform of choice. And as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.